First things first, and I hate to be pedantic, but the Jinn did not wait a hundred years, at least according to my calculation. And while we'll return to the Jinn, I'm just following the book's lead and using it as a hook. But let's dive into The Jinn Waits a Hundred Years by Shunam Khan. I also do just want to make a quick note that this review is based on a free digital arc I personally requested from the publisher. This is a dual timeline gothic set at a crumbling estate on the coast of South Africa and following primarily a young girl, Sana, who has moved in to this essentially boarding house with her father following the death of their mother. Not the immediate following of the death, but as kind of this prolonged sense of grief that exists between the two. And there is a weight and a grief even in this house, not only of the house itself, but of the kind of ensemble ensemble of characters that this house has collected in some way. And so we watch Sana kind of discovering this house and the secrets that it may be keeping. And one of the biggest secrets at the heart of this house revolves around a young woman, Mina, who was the second wife to the man who built the manor and what exactly happened there. From the very beginning where we meet a djinn tearing through the house in grief, we know the ending to that story is rooted in sadness. However, we don't know where that story is taking us. And so Sana unearths this story as she also is finding her own voice and overcoming her own grief. This is a much quieter and stiller novel than I anticipated in a lot of ways. It was comped to things like Rebecca, which I can see the echoes of and understand why that title was used. And that even is a stiller novel than many probably anticipate. But this is by no means a thriller and often it feels a little muddied in its lack of action because it is so focused on this intense character study. And even the djinn from the beginning, which like I said, tears through the house, has a very propulsive active start. It is a striking image to really hook us as readers. And then that kind of fades to the background and the djinn almost becomes more metaphor in the larger story than an active participant. And metaphor is so central to what is going on here. We have a third person omniscient voice, not the voice of the djinn, which I thought would have been really interesting and would have centered that character. I hate to say character because we really don't get the sense of them. Like I said, it feels more like a metaphor for this history and this unsaid grief that lingers in this house than an active character. But I think that there could have been an interesting angle there if the djinn was more active in the storytelling, especially because they are such a silent participant in the atmosphere of the house, and we are reminded that they're there, but in little glimpses. That being said, I think the little glimpses are where this narrative is its most successful. We get the sense of the things seen out of the corner of the eye and the way they're twisted, although the twisting is kind of the reality here, that ghost that you see out of the corner, but then you turn back and it's just the curtains fluttering. And I think the way that that was communicated was done so well here. The language of that was really masterful. It really conjured this instantaneous kind of glimpse that then fades to the background. And we don't have just one singular ghost in this narrative. We also have Sana, our main character, who is haunted by the ghost of her former sister who died when they were children. And so we have a protagonist who is already steeped in this deep grief. And this idea of grief, overcoming grief, is central here, but through the themes of home and love and what makes a person stay, which is interrogated, but I think could have been interrogated even more through the conduit of the djinn, again, who has stayed, not for a hundred years, but for a lot of years. And so this idea of everything Thing that is unsaid in this place. And the unsaid is personified. Personification is so central here, especially in terms of the language. Now, I am a fan of a flowery sentence. I do like some purple prose here and there. This kind of teeters the edge for me. It is beautiful, absolutely, but it feels like we often get lost in the language rather than the language kind of emphasizing a lot of these themes. It feels a little bit more oppressive in some ways. And in some ways, I think that that is purposeful. We start the book with the idea of heat and how that is impacting 
people more generally. So we already have this sense of place that is oppressive in some way. And then we are moved into this kind of eclectic group of characters that are often bickering, which can be emphasized by the heat and short tempers, absolutely. But even as we are moving through this kind of slower, stiller story, there are these short fuses on some ends of these stories. Now the ensemble I think could have been pushed even more because we are kind of engaging with these kind of more traditional ideas, especially with some of the older women in the house and these tensions, especially related to religion and caste because it is a community of characters with Indian heritage that are living in this house as well as are in the historical timeline, which I loved. And I went in wanting some more of that storytelling and myth behind the djinn in particular, which to be fair, not having as much of that cultural history that could be kind of baked into the storytelling here in what is unsaid. And there could be a level of nuance there that I am personally as a reader with my own perspective, just not picking up on. But at the same time, some of the other thematic explorations, while still and slow, don't necessarily strike me as subtle, especially with the repetition of explorations of things like love and home, sometimes to the detriment of kind of character development. We have Sana, who is a young girl, 15, 16 years old. And so going in, especially after she was introduced, I was keenly aware of what in the narrative makes this an adult novel, which it definitely is, versus a young adult novel with a character of this age. And I think some of that is the stillness. I feel like even in your more subtle young adult novels, the main characters are a lot more active. And here we have a character who is seeking answers, and she's definitely in a search for something, but doesn't necessarily feel active in that search. Things are kind of happening to her in some ways, and there definitely is a reason for that, especially amidst her grief and her depression, but I don't know that the narrative is really helping us through that. I'm not saying that I need this to be an action-driven novel, but it feels like things are happening to our protagonist, like I said, rather than she is actively engaging with this house and this history, rather the things are happening around her. And I think that is a metaphor in and of itself. But because of that, some of the revelations, especially at the climax, feel too easy and like we haven't earned them as readers. Additionally, the kind of jump back into the historical timeline that everything seems to really hinge on happens pretty late in the novel, in my estimation. It's like 25 to 30% in, which sure, that's still the opening of the novel, but considering that is really our forward driver and what is impacting the modern timeline, it feels very late, especially because while that is still being relayed to us in that third person kind of past, not as active, we are definitely being told a story there. I mean, it's a book, it's a story, but I think you know what I mean there. And if you don't, sorry for not being more articulate, but that is our more active storyline, even if that is the storyline in some way that we know the ending of. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know that it causes the disruption at the beginning. And that active introduction is really doing a lot of the work for me as a reader in the beginning of this book because I'm wanting to get to some of those answers. And so the voice, I think, wants to live in this realm of kind of magic in some way. It is a personified house, but not a house that I feel stands on its own or is sentient in any way. Although I think the prose wants me to think that it is sentient in some ways. One, it does do a good job at kind of putting us in the nooks and crannies and the minutia of this place and this house. Although I would argue that three references to cockroaches is three too many. And so we have this young girl who is trapped in her grief and her depression in a lot of ways. And the house is representative of that. And while the people around her and the ensemble are much older than her, they also represent these kind of potential futures as she is exploring it even, as she's asking them these questions and trying to get to know them. And we get the sense in whatever way that the house has collected these kind of lost souls and that there is this sense of grief and sadness to everyone's story that is then kind of reflected in these flashbacks. But I didn't really feel like I got to know Sana as a character. And so while the house is definitely a presence, and I think the narrative wants me to believe it is a more active participant in the story in the way it frames certain revelations to this history to Sana as something the house is revealing, I never got the sense as a reader that the house was sentient, so to speak. And I think it would be easy to correlate the house and the djinn 
as the same entity, but I do not think they were. I think they were very separate things because the djinn was kind of just observing for most of the book. I expected the djinn to be a much more active participant in the story, even just watching Sana. Even with Sana not really aware of its presence, I expected it to have a heavier hand, and rather it seemed to be more of a reflection and a metaphor for the idea of overcoming grief and the idea of kind of exercising these histories, especially as it became clear later in the book how the djinn was presenting itself, which I don't want to spoil because I think that that kind of falls under the same realm as the things caught in the corner of the eye in terms of the way the language really succeeded in some of its subtleties. There are some unquestionably evocative moments here, but I think that there needs to be a measuring of expectation into what kind of narrative you're walking or we're walking into as a reader in that it is a much stiller thing than I personally went in expecting, and it felt like I was being given the answers a lot of the time in terms of the narration. The contemporary timeline had a lot more subtlety, or maybe it had a more active exploration of the metaphor is more accurate for me to say. In relation to the historical timeline, the historical timeline was a little bit more matter of fact. We saw this blossoming love story against all odds, but at the same time we weren't really active participants in that. We didn't get to see it fully grow and flourish, and we were kind kind of led to believe through the contemporary timeline that Sana was discovering Mina's history through journals, and we would get little peeks at these journals, but it wasn't part of the narrative style of the book by any means, and neither was toward the end the kind of indication of what timeline we were in. And I think that this is a really interesting choice and one that I actually really like. I don't know that it was always utilized to its full potential, but there is one like chapter bridge in particular that sticks out to me where it talks about in the historical timeline the blossoming of a certain kind of flower, and if I were better I would remember it was a significant flower. There was surely flower symbolism there because this book was full of symbolism and metaphor, but it talks about that specific flower. And then in the entry to our contemporary timeline chapter, we reference that flower kind of coming back to bloom. So we get the sense of this house kind of perking up and awakening, but again it's much more to me that metaphorical sense than a sentient sense, if that makes sense. And with that too, we have the question of the ghost of Sana's twin, which reads to me as this personification of Sana's depression in a lot of ways, and this idea that her twin is kind of beckoning her to the other side and trying to make sure that they are together again in whatever way. And so she represents Sana's worst impulses and the impulses that Sana is actively trying to fight against. So there is some action in that personification, absolutely. But also this is the choice that is most likely to kind of push this into the realm or comparisons of magical realism. I still personally don't really know how I feel about using the term magical realism outside of Latin American storytelling. It's not a perfect system, I recognize, but that is something I'm really drawn to narratively. The speculative, the odd, the embodiment of some of these more intangible thoughts and feelings, and yet I don't know that this pushes it far enough into that feeling like a part of the world. Again, the way the voice of the novel is functioning for me as a reader, it feels a little heavier and it feels like this is kind of being forced on the narrative instead of it growing organically out of the narrative. Again, these plot lines don't feel like they're being engaged with actively enough to feel like it's going anywhere substantive for me as a reader personally. That's not to say I didn't still enjoy myself, but I'm ultimately not sure how much of this is going to stick with me. I also, as I kind of sit back and I'm looking back on my reading experience, am kind of interested in putting Sana and Mina up against each other because because there wasn't a huge age difference between them. There was a couple of years, like four or five at most, and yet there was this huge gulf in terms of experience and where their lives were, but at the same time they were both victims of circumstance in some ways, and I think that that is part of it. We knew what the outcome for Mina was going to be, and that's part of why I'm sure the historical timeline wasn't as active as it could have been, because we ultimately know where we end up there, but at the same time, Mina is inspiring something in Sana, and so to see 
what that inspiration is, what it is that kind of shakes the foundation of her and pushes her to be a more active participant in her own story. And so there is already this kind of hurdle narratively in that we are moving from a place of stillness, inaction, grief, and kind of wallowing into a more active stasis at the end. So of course the in-between is going to be a little stiller, is going to be a little bit more subtle. And so here I would argue that the atmosphere is the most important thing. And while the house, I wouldn't argue, is an active character necessarily, it is also probably the biggest presence in this novel. And we can see the kind of transposing of the grand history with the dilapidated present. And that's kind of the ultimate metaphor for the state these characters' lives are in. And so then one of the main moments toward the end of the book makes complete sense in terms of kind of pointing to a new stasis and a new future for these characters. And slight spoiler for those familiar, but that action may tie us more directly to Rebecca as well. And also represents another example of a narrative where we start at the end and it's about the journey getting there rather than the revelation of the end in some way. And so while admittedly this book wasn't exactly what I was expecting, it still does have some real gems of moments in terms of its language and its metaphor, and especially, like I said, its ability to kind of illuminate the thing out of the corner of the eye and twist our perception of that. And I think that that is where it succeeds the most. So if you've read this, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts, especially in relation to how you think it maneuvers the two timelines and how it engages with metaphor and its thematic explorations. But regardless, thank you as always for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Read something good and yeah, bye.